So after 10 years of growing now, probably 10 plus years, I've had a lot of different things that have come up that have damn near ruined my garden, almost completely shut things down. Now, I don't know about you, but these things have been maybe preventable, or if I would have known how to prevent these things, I wouldn't have had to deal with them, wouldn't have potentially had to shut the garden down. What you don't know can hurt you, not only in life, but in the garden too. So in this video, we're gonna go over the top 10 things that could potentially ruin your entire garden and how to avoid them. So before we get started, we appreciate all the subscribers. Really appreciate all the love that you've been showing, all the comments, everything. It really helps the channel grow. If you're not a subscriber, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell next to it to be notified every time we drop new content, which will be every Sunday. So these are in no particular order, but one of the first mistakes that you can make in the garden is having a male sneak into your room. And that can happen by way of just not knowing how to sex the plant or if you're popping seeds of any sort that are regular or not feminized. And I've even heard of certain feminized seeds that come from maybe a lackluster seed company not being feminized seeds. What the fuck? Keep an eye on that uh, when you're vegging your plant. You don't want a male plant in the same space as your female plants. Why? Doesn't take long for that plant uh, for that male plant to pollinate the rest of your female plants and when you go to flower these plants They're going to be affected in overall yield final quality of your bud And you're gonna have a lot of seeds in there and nobody really wants that unless you're looking to breed and that's a whole Another lane so that being said if you do come across a male plant that you want to play with as far as genetics or for whatever little test subject you may have quarantine it get it as far away from any kind of female plant that you have because otherwise it's just going to become a really big headache for you the next mistake to avoid is light now not light in general but light mistakes now looking at things like low quality lighting just regular house lighting i hear a lot of people saying they're just using a regular led from in their house or some basic light but essentially it's not going to be enough power to give your plant what it needs now your seedling may grow, it may be decent, so to speak, but it's not gonna pack on the weight that'll make it worth growing. Now, if you do have good quality lighting, you need to make sure that you have the right amount. Too little or too much could definitely hurt your garden. Now, if you're looking at a scenario with too little of lighting, those plants are gonna basically just be weak and wispy and they're not gonna grow like they need to. Too much, it could potentially cause stress and hurt them and overall stunt the growth at the same time. So you don't wanna get too much or too little, you wanna kinda of find that right point, especially for how many plants you have within your space. Another thing is you don't wanna have your lights too close or too far. Now having them too close could potentially burn them, especially in flower, even in veg. If your plants are getting into the lights, they're gonna burn. It's happened to me numerous times, it still happens when I don't do low stress training or scrogging. So you wanna make sure you're paying attention to how close that light is. If it's too far away, your plants are gonna stretch. Now I've had times where seedlings were a little bit lower than clones that I had, or the, the canopy wasn't completely even and at that point I had lankier gangly plants compared to the stronger more stout good ones of the same exact genetics but it was because one was closer to the light the other was further so it was stretching to reach for it so you want to make sure that the light is kind of in an ideal place normally for me using the 315 watt ceramic metal halide I keep my light around six inches to maybe 18 inches at the very most another problem could be not necessarily the light in your room but the light outside your room now especially in flower this is the biggest issue is if you have light leakage in your room, you risk getting seeds. Essentially, the stress to your plant could cause seeds. It's not gonna re because it's not consistent light, it's just light leakage, it's some coming in there. Now, if you have a tent, you wanna make sure that it's sealed up and that you don't have any holes or issues like that. If you're in a room that's essentially just built up from the ground up or that you've put together, you wanna make sure that there's no light leakage at night. You can use something like a green light to kind of cancel it out, but for the most part, you need to seal up everything so that there's no light coming in to ruin your flower. Out of the next one. Another mistake a lot of people make is they don't have enough airflow in their garden or wind, however you want to put it. Now, when we talk about wind, you obviously want to fan, you know, pushing air around your plants. You don't want any kind of stagnant air, but you also don't want just dead on straight fan in your face. No, you don't like that. Your plants don't like that. So it's going to... Uh, not only kind of damage them if they're young it can knock them over uh, it can also untrain them or if you're trying to bend or uh, low stress train it can end up blowing your bud sites if you're in flower or your or your leaves to kind of turn like they do in the trees in the wind outside but aside from that you need a good intake and outtake a pushing and pulling of air you know maximizing all the airflow around your plants so that you are not at risk for any kind of pm or other issues. You wanna have constant exchange of air. 
uh, outside it's a constant exchange of air it's called wind so you have to recreate that inside in both facets of around your plants and in and out and around of your plants <laughs> Next mistake you want to avoid is low quality or not enough nutrients. Now in different points of your garden, plants are going to need different nutrients, the macro and the micronutrients. Now essentially, all plants are going to need the same thing, but when they need it is going to vary. So if you're not feeding your plants at the right time, you're going to really struggle with getting the results they need. Too much nitrogen in flower is going to result in toxicities. Not enough nitrogen in veg could result in deficiencies. So also when it comes to bottle nutrients, even different amended nutrients in your mediums or dry amendments, whatever, it does vary in what the mixes contain. Now some things are going to have more all-in-one mixes, others are going to be broken apart as kind of like a key, like with advanced nutrients they have everything broken down piece by piece, which can be good for some growers, but on other growers it could be a little bit of an issue. Also if you're looking at an amended medium, something like that has essentially all your nutrients in them, you want to make sure that it's the right quality, that it's meant for the right stages of your garden, and that you're amending it properly if you need to. Now something like a happy frog, I know people will just be like, good to go! Well for the first three weeks you're good. Same with something like a miracle grow, and throughout that, you're not necessarily gonna have the full grow period. Now there's different full soils, like a build a soil that you can mix yourself, but at the same time, you're gonna have to mix a flowering solution. You're not gonna be able to just have only vet. Whether you have to add a tea or amend more for flowering, you're gonna have to do something to make sure that you're getting the right amount of nutrients through that whole entire process. So the next thing you really wanna avoid in that you know, even 10 years into it, my dumbass still sometimes falls victim to is slacking or being lazy with the IPM. Now, in general, this is a crucial thing. Integrated pest management is a must. Same with disease. You need to be on top of this from start to finish. Now, recently, when finishing my course and working on another course right now for the 420 Growers Club, I was really slacking on my veg. I, I didn't pay as much attention to it. I didn't even train my plants quite as much because I was so focused on documenting the content in the flowering room. So with that being said, I wasn't working on IPM in there. So I brought in two clones that were strains that I really like, but one happened to have thrips. Unfortunately, it spread. And by not being on top of it, not having the initial management set up and in the avoidance set up, I let it happen. You can shoot yourself in the foot by not being on top of things. Some growers get away with an entire cycle not having to worry about it, but others, if you have those problems in veg where you end up getting the bugs, you're gonna be dealing with it all the way up in the harvest. And you know, if you smoke brick weed like us back in the day, you've probably smoked a lot of weird bugs and a lot of weird shit. But nowadays, there's no reason why you should do that, especially when you grow it yourself. So if you're avoiding stuff and take care of the management when you're in veg and you're just in general on top of it and not being lazy, not slacking, your whole garden will definitely flourish. This is another mistake that can be made by growers novice to veteran. Um, and I am also guilty of the last uh, mistake, being lazy with your IPM, which can ultimately breed you or veg you or grow you weak genetics. Um, even if the genetic was great when you got it, if you didn't train it to uh, not have issues or not train <laughs> your plant to be strong and resilient, then that's ultimately what you're going to get in the final product. So bad vegging doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bunch of sickly looking plants, but ultimately uh, if you're not lazy in your IPM and you are, you know, monitoring and managing your veg time well, you're going to have pretty resilient, strong genetics and you're going to have a good result. Uh, the other mistake that can be make, make, make it, make it, <laughs> other mistakes that you can make as far as bad vegging can be too little amount of time. You know, some people veg for two, two and a half weeks and not quite understand why their yield or their plant doesn't finish well and it's like well you vegged it too short of time for it to really get to a place where it was ready to produce the kind of flower that you wanted it to other times a lot of the time i see guys vegging for an extended amount of time that either they don't have the space to flower out or that whole time they spent vegging and being lazy that now that plant is exactly that, a lazy plant that you put into flower and it either can't support itself. With your broke ass. This doesn't produce the bud that you wanted it to. It all depends on how much effort you put in as far as you get out. The next thing that I, I can't stress enough, I've talked about so much and Trey almost knocks me for it at this point is do not clone a shitty phenotype or don't let a good phenotype go. Make sure you clone it. Make sure you get the one 
that you've been looking for. You know, I've popped so many seeds, it's ridiculous now. Between tester seeds that we've done, you know, sponsored seeds, ones that I've grown on my own, ones I've been given, clones that I've gotten, there's been so many that I've had that were just bullshit that I've cloned and that I've grown out that I don't know why I grew. And then on the other hand, there's been great ones that I just let go. I didn't, didn't clone the one that I should have. At the time I was doing pick and mix, one or two seeds. Wasn't necessarily finding the phenotypes I was looking for. Once I got the packs, the game changed. I started finding the ones I really wanted. Problem was, my damn ass would only clone one or two. I'd clone the one plant that I was like, I like that one. And I didn't realize that that may not be the phenotype that I want. It may veg like I want, but it may not flower like I want. Make sure that you clone the correct phenotype and make sure that you're pheno hunting. When you're popping seeds, you wanna make sure that you're doing at least you know three to five at the minimal, especially when you're growing these newer generation strains, the ones that have been crossed numerous times, the hybrids of hybrids, so to speak, because the phenotypes really vary. Sometimes you can find a lot of really good ones, other times you can find just a bunch of bullshit ones. But if you're not doing multiple seeds at once, you're definitely not gonna find that exact phenotype that you're looking for. <laughs> So another mistake that I see uh, probably too often, <laughs> and I'm guilty of too. I think me and Rob are both guilty of all these things we're telling you guys. That's why we try to bring it to you, because we try to save you guys a whole bunch of trial and error. Um, but too much plants, not enough space. Um, the other way around can also go where you have one plant and you're trying to make the most of it. But ultimately overcrowding can just lead to shadowing of bud sites um, just the plants fighting for light and your plants are always going to want more light i would just say use your real estate wisely don't overcrowd your plants and let them work for you so number nine would be do not spray anything during flower especially like later into flower you really don't want to do that i've sprayed midway through like two weeks three weeks in but mainly just on the stems or on the leaves and that's only when i had an issue like powdery mildew and i really didn't want to have to throw my plants out and it's just me smoking it but for the most part there's some major risks that you can deal with now recently i had a, a close person will say spray some plants with uh i don't even know what the substance was but sprayed some plants for mites during when the lights were on. When you do that, you risk burning your plants. All the water droplets essentially can magnify onto your leaves, and it's just like using a magnifying glass. It'll burn holes right into your leaves, and it'll leave your plants just all riddled up and messed up. And then if you're spraying in flower when the lights come on, you risk not only bud rot, but burning those plants too. Not just the leaves, but burning the bud. You can have, you know, pistols that are completely white, that also the next day are totally orange, literally just from them being burnt. So you wanna make sure you avoid spraying anything at all in there. I've even seen powdery mildew pop up from the moisture getting trapped in little areas like lower ends of the leaves, bases of the plant, things like that. You wanna make sure that you don't have any sort of extra moisture in there. You're keeping those, you know, the humidity level right and adding spray to there is just gonna fuck things up. And in general, smoking any kind of pesticides, miticide, anything like that is gonna be bad. You don't wanna do that. There hasn't been like 20 years, 30 years of testing on what it's like to smoke it. So, I mean, think about smoking cigarettes. They're adding all these random chemicals to it. We don't wanna add extra chemicals and smoke it. This is cannabis, so. Don't spray your shit, just do it in veg. For our final and tenth uh, mistake to avoid, I'm going to let my mans handle this just because it's uh, something he's uh, guilty of making the mistake of more than I am. Um, not that I am innocent. Guilty as charged? And with that being said, the last and final and honestly and one of my most important pieces of advice that I could say and I've said it in other videos and so has Trey to pull your plants at the right time now essentially some genetics are going to vary I've had some that'll be done in you know seven weeks literally like 49 days I've had a strain done and I've had others of the same seeds that needed 56 days and then right now currently I have one that is ready in eight weeks and I have one that's ready in nine weeks now you can fuck around and pull a plant a little bit too early based on just the look. And it's not really gonna be fully mature or have the terps that you're looking for. Speaking of. This doesn't either. You need to look at more things like the trichomes. Recently a Gromy in the 420 Growers Club was talking about a plant he was gonna pull and honestly I think it needs a little bit longer. Looking at just the outside of the plant, it does look just about ready. But what you really need to look at is those trichomes because in general, the plant is gonna tell you when it's ready. Not just things like the pistols, you know, the hairs essentially, but you want to look more at those trichomes, the heads. You know, in general, I've had a lot of people hit me up thinking, oh, this bud's done, and the package says it'd be done in 56 days, or, oh, it said it'd be done in this amount of time. 
you gotta judge the plant by the plant, making sure you're looking at all the different areas of it. And knowing that the plant's gonna be done soon, you wanna make sure that you're flushing it accordingly. Now, if you're in a totally organic amended medium, you may not need to, but most mediums, you're gonna need to flush it. So knowing that your trichomes are starting to get to that amber point and you need another two weeks to finish, you're gonna to wanna to start to flush, let them finish off properly, or you're gonna risk getting some hay flavored, basic, boofy ass weed. And that really sucks when you put all that effort from veg to finish and the finish was just crap. If this video helped you and you need more tips like that or you need some one-on-one -on -one help with your grow, check out the 420 Growers Club. Link will be in the description. We appreciate it and you already know, stay lifted.